My name is Father Gregory Pine, and I am a Dominican friar of the province of St. Joseph, and you are back with us here on the Thomistic Institute podcast for the most recent installment of Off-Campus Conversations. As we have made mention many times to this point, the, the hope here is that we can follow up with Thomistic Institute speakers who will have given lectures on campus or in the setting of a conference or a retreat, so that way we can deepen some of the insights or suss out the details of their particular presentation. So. For this episode, I'm very delighted to be joined by Professor Mary Keyes. Uh, so thanks so much for joining. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we're, look we're looking forward to the conversation, especially because some of your research interests are not necessarily research interests of mine, but particular things that I'm interested in and don't know how to describe well. Instead, just fumble around in the dark. So I'm, I'm looking to you to help formulate some of those <laughs> insights more coherently. <laughs> Um, but for those who, who don't know you, many will know you from, you know, contributions, uh, you know, to the Thomistic Institute podcast from, from your publications on the common good on St. Augustine on St. Thomas Aquinas. But for those who don't know you, would you just say a word of, of introduction, who you are, where you're from, what you do? Sure. So, um, I'm, uh, a professor of political science at Notre Dame and I'm originally from Washington DC, but have lived in Indiana for close to 30 years now. So I think I'm officially a Hoosier. Um, and my research interest is in the area of uh, virtue theory, legal philosophy, and political thought. Uh, I'm especially interested in the insights that Christianity can bring to bear in conversations uh, concerning political theory and the relation between ethics and politics in, in today's world. So, yeah, it's a little bit about me. And, and my research has been mostly first on Thomas Aquinas' thought and then most recently on St. Augustine's. Um, so yeah, I've learned a lot from from both of those giants. And so it's it's a real pleasure to it was a pleasure to speak at the Harvard Thomistic Institute a few months ago, uh, the graduate Thomistic Institute and and to be on this uh, to be on this podcast and get to have a conversation with you. So thank you. Yeah, no, I um I really love the chapter at Harvard. And I think uh, one one thing that commends them is that they're they're committed to the discourse and. Um, which you cannot take for granted, you know, in the 21st century, just because, you know, there are different ways to try to host conversations or to try to get your point across. And uh, I really, yeah, I really enjoyed getting to know those folks, especially Amy Chandran and having conversations with them. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so in your lecture, you were describing, you know, on the basis of your research, uh, specifically in reading the city of God and kind of tracking the virtue of humility there as the antidote to or the the deeper foundation, I should say, the antidote to pride and the deeper foundation of the virtuous life um, and trying to, to read more broadly than many scholars will do to give a kind of holistic account. Um, you're talking, you know, about the, the interconnection among the virtues and saying, you know, if you if you want peace, secure justice, you'll often hear said. So what's the connection between justice and peace, which traditionally is often associated with charity and then charity and humility, which is typically described as a kind of foundational virtue upon which the rest of the virtuous life is is built or based. So I thought that we could just just follow up on those three virtues and just say a little bit more for a contemporary audience because um, sometimes you know when I say justice and I'm talking to somebody who's working out of a a more you know modern or postmodern mindset, they might hear justice in a different way. So for a 21st century audience, what are the things that are most precious to to Saint Augustine when he is communicating specifically about justice? So uh, I would say that for, for St. Augustine, he speaks of, um, in a platonic mode, I think, of justice in as uh, an, an order of, well, building on a platonic mode. So uh, a certain just order he speaks of in the city of God that nature has put into the soul, uh, which is that the, the mind is subordinate uh, to God, and then the emotions and the body to the mind, um, which then brings a whole human person into subordination to God. And that subordination is not a negative thing for, for Augustine. It's, it's a, a positive and uplifting just order. Uh, similarly, when he thinks about justice in political societies, there should be, as he says, uh, uh, an an order of equality among human beings under God. So that is, I think, a, a very crucial insight that Augustine has, that there is, before all the inequalities that human society does bring with it, there's a, 
before and and in a sense as a foundation and a goal, there is a, a just form of what he calls equality among human beings under God or a fellowship of human beings under God. So, um, so yeah, so that's, that's for starters. I don't know if you have any follow-up questions I could clarify. Yeah. I, so follow-up questions specifically about subordination or differentiation. Um, we might just follow up under the aspect of, of hierarchy. Um, it strikes me that, you know, in your description, St. Augustine has a hierarchical understanding of justice, its administration, and then the flourishing of those concerned. I think that's for, for a 21st century audience, that's an especially difficult thing to hear because whenever we hear different, we think better and worse. We think condescension. We think, you know, you're patronizing me. You're patting me on the head. Um, you know, again, in St. Saint, Saint Augustine's understanding, how is it that, that hierarchy, like you describe it, is a source of, of like political goods or even of, you know, like the... You, you talked about peace or tranquility of order as the end desired by the polity for which it's, you know, politicians or legislators work. So, so how is, how is hierarchy connected to, to human flourishing and his understanding? Okay. So yeah, that, that's a great question. I think, first of all, I'd say that Augustine, I, one of the things that I think is appealing for modern readers and contemporary readers, uh, in Augustine's thought is that he does, he shares a certain suspicion of, uh, how to say it, the, some, some of the proclivities proclivities that uh, hierarchy can, uh, how to say it, uh, towards, towards injustice or towards hubris. So uh, for, for Augustine, the, uh, so differentiation of roles should always be with a view to service of, the, of all the people under one's authority, if one's in a governing position, whether that's in the church or civil society, is a a key mode of, of service and a service that, again, I just want to underscore Augustine traces back to a fundamental, first of all, God's humility, God's condescension, God's like coming down to our level, especially in the incarnation and redemption that Christ brings to bear. Like that's the model you could say back to the Last Supper where, where uh, Jesus makes so clear that and, and other places in the gospels that, that to serve is to reign, that, you know, the, the Lord washes the feet of the others, that, and that everyone is, who is following him is called to do likewise. This is a very, in many ways, a very radically different mode of, of hierarchical leadership than, than was typically seen in, in ancient political societies like Rome, for example. Uh, and, uh, and so, and Augustine's emphasis on humility and his critique of superbia, which is, you know, the, as I know you well know, but the, the vice of pride, um, and as it's often translated, that because of this from original sin, from the, the impact of sinfulness in human culture and in each of our individual lives, there's a call that Augustine uh, gives to people in leadership positions to be aware that 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 sort of that tugging down or that in artificial inflating or lifting up, he calls this empty puffing up of pride, is is something to be guarded against and and something to be assumed that it's it's there somewhere. At least it's trying to rear it, rear its head. And so there's both an emphasis on uh, specific roles in society and at the same time an, an emphasis on our fundamental human equality under God and. Uh, an awareness that uh, that we're we're going to be pulled towards most in different ways, different different extents. But there's this this vanity or this this desire for domination rather than desire for service, and they should be checked and guarded against. Okay, so yeah, we can already see how charity and humility are implicated by a consideration of justice in his understanding, which is, yeah, it's just sweet to see the interconnection of the virtues as a kind of organic phenomenon. Um, so as, as you're describing that, I've been rereading the confessions recently, and I'm thinking of the service or the leadership, the hierarchy modeled by St. Ambrose. And I've forgotten which book, somewhere in the middle, book like six or eight or something like that, where he's talking about how St. Ambrose's preaching was of such service to him insofar as it helped him clarify uh, or correct Manichaean notions that he had entertained for many years, and also like the way in which he weighs in on kind of petty disputes amongst Christians in the city, like the way in which he functions 
as a kind of procurator of justice among the Christian community is also something edifying. So we see that, you know, very clearly in the ecclesial setting. But I don't think that um, we, we, we too often think of this type of kind of servant leadership in the, so we think about it in the ecclesial sphere, but we don't think about it as much in the political sphere. I know that you've, you know, done some work on like civic friendship or like friendship as it concerns the common good. Is there something like that in Augustine? Does he have an, an understanding of servant leadership in the more kind of secular setting, if one can speak in those terms? Yeah, so I, I think I think he does. Um, and so one example that he gives, and, and this example is not uh, is not unproblematic, and I think Augustine's aware of that, but the Emperor Theodosius is one example uh, that, and not as a perfect model by a long shot, but as somebody who who was um how to say it uh was willing to care for uh for example the the son of of um you know of of a rival or of a, a, a potential co-ruler who worked for uh well who was willing to embrace church discipline i mean sort of circling back to ambrose as somebody who Augustine thinks uh, Theodosius made a very serious mistake, as Ambrose and the other bishops pointed out, in in condoning what was a massacre. But then uh, Ambrose required him to to do public penance if he wanted to to come back into full communion with the church, and Theodosius did this. So there is, uh, yeah. So there there is there aren't that many examples. Uh, that Augustine will will draw out in detail, but his whole his whole treatment of politics, I think, suggests well, this is what the Christian ruler and this is what a truly humane ruler is called is called to do. And um, yeah, I I don't know if that's if that's helpful or if you have follow up yeah, questions no. there as well. Certainly, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I um, okay, yeah, I think we've you know touched on charity. Uh, even there, just kind of gesturing towards reconciliation and communion a couple of times. And maybe it's just a good point to transition into that conversation because that was really, you know, that's part of, um, yeah, just it's an important piece of understanding humility insofar as humility creates a space for, you know, charity to flood in. Um, and I think that, uh, you, you know, like this important connection between charity and peace might be a good place to start. Um, I think some people in their minds, when they think about Christian charity, they think about it as a kind of doormat mentality or victim mentality, whereby you permit others to run roughshod over you and, you know, justice kind of gets left off to the side. And yet, you know, you're saying that, that, that peace issues from charity. So can you draw out that connection, how it is that the two are related charity and peace? Uh, sure. So, uh, and, and here we, we can, uh, just touch on Thomas Aquinas as, as one place where I think it one can learn a lot. One of the many places one can learn a lot from his thought on the virtues is, is uh, the, the fact that he makes a, close, a closer connection even between charity and peace than he does between justice and peace, or a more intrinsic, a more intrinsic connection, uh, although both, both charity and justice are very important for peace as, as he sees it. So, uh, so yeah, so insofar as charity uh, through as being love, right? As as being this this gift of divine love that a human freely accepts and allows to transform one's own relationships by God's grace and and one's own effort to correspond to that grace. That uh, charity brings humans together. It it's it's a unitive force in a way that even justice it it can achieve a unity among people that just which is without reduction to uniformity uh without even without you know requiring agreement on a lot of temporal issues that are very debatable and and, and uh one can have a variety of opinions and still be in in communion with one's fellows so charity charity uh brings people together in a desire of of willing the good and of allowing that uh, that love to transform one's life and relationships, and Augustine is a much less systematic um, thinker, I think, than Aquinas, or at least as a writer. It's uh, he has, of course, he has he has an understanding of the relations among things, and but less perhaps of a scientific taxology of of the virtues and other things. But I think for Augustine, um, you know. Augustine emphasizes that mercy is important, but mercy 
needs to be with justice. There, there's not an opposition between the two virtues. And similarly, charity um, charity gives rise to a um, how to put this like with with charity, one seeks uh, justice and uh, an orderly relationship among people and and society for the good of all. Uh, and yet, at the same time, it might it might require punishment. It might require uh, it might require uh, restraint. It it's uh, it's it's not an invitation to allow anything for the sake of peace and and just getting on together. Yeah, it seems as as you're describing that, um, I'm thinking of. So I just finished my dissertation. And I just turned it in. And bravo! Um, <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. I appreciate that. Um, and, uh, the first chapter it's, it's about soteriology, according to St. Thomas Aquinas. And the first chapter was a kind of, uh, state of the question survey of where a lot of people approach St. Thomas Aquinas on matters of soteriology. And a lot of people go straight to Tertia Parr's question 48 articles one through six there in the Summa Theologiae. And the second one is about satisfaction. And, you know, he starts with merit, the, animating principle of which is charity is love and then he moves to satisfaction which at least in visible form is specified by punishment which might to some seem strange like you'll have 20th century authors who describe it as a kind of bloody travesty to insist as much um, but you see in saint thomas's understanding right this insistence upon punishment specifying a type of movement which is namely satisfaction um, the real heart of the matter of which is still charity but that you know, takes this visible dimension from the punitive aspect. And then he says, like in one of his responses to an objections, that insisting upon justice in just, in just such a way actually unleashes, and that he doesn't use that word, obviously I do. I don't know if anybody used that word in the 13th century, uh, but it, it releases a more copious mercy, um, which sounds so strange and so paradoxical, but we can appreciate it from the vantage that, you know, like when when you have a dispute with somebody and you offend them, right, or you sin against them and you beg pardon and the person says, yeah, it's no big deal. You know, that like that kind of cheapens the experience, whereas when the person says, I forgive you and permits you to reckon with the fact of your offense more more gravely, you know, more urgently, that that can be a real occasion of change, right? Like I was on one occasion, I, I offended a friend whom I love very much, and he told me that I had done so in terms that he would ordinarily never use because he's kind of in the habit of making things less grave or just less difficult for me. But in that, it was like I knew that, yeah, that I that I had to reckon with it. So, yeah, it's like when these things, when these virtues come together, or when these different dynamics come together, it's it's very beautiful and symphonic, almost harmonic. But it, it seems at first blush as if there were a kind of tension. But yeah, I don't know if you have further thoughts yeah, on no, that. Yeah, that's, that's, I think that's a great example. So one thing that's, that stands out in Augustine's uh, treatment of, of uh, both humility and I would say, and pride, and then also mercy in the city of God is, uh, is a recurring trope. It, it's, he doesn't, it's, it's uh, at least used more than once and, and probably a few times at least that, that God's, um, so going back to Hannah's canticle uh, in in the Old Testament, and uh, when she speaks of how um, you know he puts the the proud down from their seats and exalts the humble, um, Augustine will comment, "Well, God's uh, God's mercy often requires like allowing us to sort of feel the impact of of our sinfulness and of our the evil in our lives." And yet that's always with mercy so that, that there's this, this hope that that sort of, you know, it's an experience perhaps of, of hitting bottom or maybe something less dramatic, but of, of being aware of maybe just at first through the consequences and then reflecting on some of the causes. If, if some of those causes are internal to me, like, for example, hurting a friend, like you just, you, you just suggest that I think we can all relate to that, that, um, that, the, the sadness, the misery, the seeing that in the other person's life and, and sort of reckoning with that in our own life, that, that that's, that's like a prelude to being lifted up again, that, you know, to, to being able to, to welcome that forgiveness, that love, and begin again, you know, with, with hope, and, but without sort of cheapening uh, the, the injustice that, that we may have committed. And, 
And also what you were saying, Father, reminds me of, of Augustine's another another recurring theme is the our father and that prayer forgive us you know forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who who trespass against us augustine likes to say well this is the daily prayer of the christian and who but a proud person and i think humanly speaking we can broaden this this isn't just about christians that any reflective you know human being is aware well who who could who could say i never need to ask forgiveness like not, not a, as Augustine says, not a truly great person, just someone who's, who's inflated, who's puffed up with pride. And that can be all of us at some times, but then there are experiences in life that call us to wait a minute, you know, what have I done? And, and I can, I can brush it aside or I can, I can face it and, and, um, with God's mercy and grace begin again. Uh, and I, I think forgiveness, I think this is one thing Augustine may have learned from Ambrose. Ambrose has, uh, in, in his correspondence with Theodosius, he has a, um, how to say it, he, he calls Theodosius's attention to David's example in the, in the Old Testament when uh, he, he realizes that, that he sinned and he needs to ask for forgiveness and God's mercy. And at first he doesn't realize when he's committed a, a very serious crime or series of crimes. And Augustine, uh, excuse me, Ambrose sort of calls Theodosius's attention to that and, and says, look, the problem isn't that, yes, sin is, is, isn't good, but the real problem is not recognizing it and not being willing to repent. And so it's a call to repentance. And I think that that is, is echoed in, um, in, in Augustine's City of God as well. Okay. So in hearing you describe, yeah, this phenomenon, uh, you know, humility is entering squarely into the picture. So I'm thinking again of the aforementioned dissertation. So I'm a megalomaniac, so I'm just going to talk about my dissertation. Yikes. Um, so in, in chapter five, I was describing or I was trying to synthesize St. Thomas's teaching on the ascension. And he makes this association between mysteries of descent and mysteries of ascent, or we might call the mysteries of abasement and exaltation or mysteries of self-emptying and glorification, however we want to characterize it. Um, but he'll, you know, he notes the fact that in our, in our Lord's passion, you know, he suffers not only in his body and in his psyche, but he also suffers a certain ignominy uh, or he suffers a certain, yeah, what will one say, um, scorn, mockery, derision in the eyes of men. And then there's furthermore the death that is, you know, the burial and then the descent into hell. And he corresponds those four mysteries with, or he draws a connection between those four mysteries or among those four mysteries and a fourfold exaltation. So his resurrection and then the exaltation of his holy name, his ascension, and then his seating at the right hand and judging in glory. So, you know, insofar as St. Thomas is a master synthesizer and always going for neat descriptions of reality, Perhaps you don't find something comparable in St. Augustine, but I imagine you find some connection between, you know, humiliation and exaltation on the pattern of, like you said, the, the Song of Hannah, you know, the Magnificat, the Philippians hymn, things like that. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Uh, so now that's, that's now, I'm, now I'm eager to read your dissertation. <laughs> so that you're doing a great job. <laughs> of like, it's on an important theme. So, but yes, definitely. I think uh, with Augustine, so just in the city of God, for example, at the, the very beginning, he, um, he emphasizes how, how difficult it's going to be to persuade the proud of the excellence of humility that, you know, while it, it seems a matter of lowliness really is what lifts us above all the inconstancy and the, the you could say the tumults that cause us to sway in, in this, this age. Uh, and then that his discussion of Hannah's canticle is, it's really striking. It's one of the longest chapters in the entire city of God. I mean, one of, I would say one of the two or three. I haven't done the word counts, so I don't know, don't know exactly, but it's, it's, it's striking for its length. And, and this, uh, this theme of exaltation, uh, abasement, exaltation. Uh, and I would say too, for Augustine, it's, there's a crystal, obviously there's the, the Christological core, you could say, um, this, his, his, his little pithy, uh, comment in his sermons. Well, if you want to, do you want to grasp God's exaltedness, right? Grasp first God's humility. Like, and then you see throughout his work, how do we grasp his humility? Well, best, well, through, through Jesus, through the, the incarnation, the, the redemption and, and, uh, redemption, resurrection, ascension of, of Jesus. So 
And he, he speaks in the city of God of how Christ's second coming will be like his glory will be fully revealed and, and it will be exalted as just as with his first, he first came in humility. And I don't know if he uses a term like abasement per se, but lowliness is a, is a repeated trope in, in Augustine. So, and, and I think that it's really very, uh, I'd say like very, very, um, very much at the heart or very dear to Augustine, this, this sense of, and it's a very positive reality because, because of God's exaltation, his exaltedness by nature, his perfection, yet he, he doesn't despise coming down and accepting the lowliness of our condition and, and dying to a very shameful death to redeem us. And, uh, and then inviting us into this like good deification, <laughs> the the real, the real deal, the good divinization, that it, the um, not the the false hubristic divinization of the Roman emperors or the 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 proudest among the the elites of this world, but this uh, this this uh, form of exaltation that can really take on one's uh, embrace one's lowliness and and bring us to share in the fullness of of God's life and love. Um, if I said anything heretical, let me know, but <laughs> that's my best, that's my best read. You crush yeah, it. no, there's, there's, <laughs> um, yeah, definitely. So I, that's, that's, uh, yeah, that, that's a, I, yeah, could probably say more, but I'll, but I'll stop there for now. There's, there's just so much of along those lines in Augustine's thought. Yeah. It's yeah. As you're, as you're talking, um, so when we describe humility in the Christian tradition, it's so natural for us to appeal to Christ insofar as he makes humility visible and vividly so, manifestly so. Um, and I'm thinking of, you know, when St. Thomas describes the motives for the incarnation in Tertia Pars Question 1, Article 2, he gives these 10 reasons and he quotes St. Augustine like eight or nine times. It's just like... <laughs> It's just like synthesizing St. Augustine. Um, but, but a lot of it is this. It's just to, to like make manifest the life of virtue with a kind of power, with a kind of intensity, so as to communicate, or, you know, like in manifesting it, to communicate it with greater, with greater efficacy. Not that the divine causality ever lies fallow, but, you know, he can, make, he can make his crops yet more nourishing, yet more, you know, sustaining. Um, so I'm thinking then... And, and here I have in mind Alistair McIntyre's point where he talks about the reevaluation of the hierarchy of virtues through the ages with these different paradigms. And when he goes, I think it's in Who's Justice, Which Rationality, and when he goes from the, you know, the Homeric paradigm to the Augustinian paradigm, I think he comments on humility. He says something to the effect of like, we needed humility revealed to us and then communicated to us in the life of grace. Um, I mean, is, is, I mean, where do we... <laughs> Where do, where do we find humility in Augustine's antecedents if they exist? And if not, I mean, is there a way really to conceive of humility apart from having it revealed and bestowed in grace? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I, so, and here I'll, I'll, I'll summarize just a little bit from the, from my book uh, toward in the, the earlier sections, especially, I mean, I think, I think well, I'll just say first of all, I, I think yes, clearly I think Augustine thinks we we needed humility revealed, uh, but he also thinks it corresponds to who we are by nature, and so it's not simply a matter of revealing something that's outside that's in the supernatural realm that is part of God's plan for us and doesn't correspond to who we are, what we we naturally desire. Uh, thinks. No, it's yes. Nature is 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 broken, but it's not undone. And so there there's something in humility uh, that that we can grasp and comprehend, and at least uh, perhaps see that we can aspire to it. So I think that's why Augustine begins from what he thinks is um, much. It may be more easily accessible to a wider range of readers, not just believers. Which is, let's look at. And, and you can see this in the antecedents. So I'm thinking the uh, maybe the tragic poets, but the the the, the perils of hubris, you know, and the and the the misery that gets unleashed by even in, according to some of the Roman historians who preceded Christ uh, by by superbia, by superbia sort of uh, opening Pandora's box and and ultimately getting us to uh, a love of domination instead of a, a real like concern for justice and welfare of, of others. But, uh, so I think 
for Augustine, I, I hear I, maybe I can I sort of uh, fast forward a lot, but to the Second Vatican Council, a, a line that Pope John Paul II loves so much, which is that uh, only in the mystery of Christ is the mystery of the of man, of human being, fully revealed. You know, and and I think there, Augustine expects that humility will be at first sight a tough tough sell and something that isn't intuitive. But if if we look at find if we find ways to initiate the discourse and then to somehow describe the beauty of humility, that it will be something that and and I think this is. At least this is my experience and, and my field political theory where a majority of my colleagues probably are, are not Christian, um, at least a, a you know, significant proportion. And there's, you know, there might be some, some paradox, or, but, but there's been a lot of openness, I think, to, to the theme. And there are people working on, I, my colleague Vicki Spencer from New Zealand is working on a book on humility and contemporary democratic political theory where there's a lot of overlap. Um, there's some significant differences, I'd say, but, but a lot of overlap between her theory of humility and Augustine's. Uh, there have been other colleagues who've, who've written on humility in different forms. So I think there's, there's something appealing there and that, that indicates that, um, but, but at the same time, yes, do, do we need revelation? I, I think hands down, yes, <laughs> I think for Augustine and, and I, I would concur. Yeah. That's, I mean, not, not to get too much into it, but just as a kind of throwaway comment, I think there is such a, yeah, there's something so wonderful about a public admission of ignorance or incompetence, not in like a crass sense, but like, you know, when you have it from a public official who's weighing in on whatever issue, just to simply say like, I don't know. And I don't know that we will know, like we're trying, we're making every effort, but, um, I think this is just a contingent future event or this is just a situation and we're still at the stage of gathering information like that can provide such a, yeah, such a space in the public setting for people to be like, oh, OK, I need to be patient. Oh, I need to be merciful. Oh, I need to be understanding. Whereas if we pretend to know what we may know somewhat of or may not really know entirely, then we can create all kinds of problems. And it's funny, like in like political discourse, especially with. You know, this whole phenomenon of keeping receipts and everything that you say now is recorded and posted in public, you know, public spaces. Yeah, it's, it can be very merciless, ruthless. You're right. It can be very unforgiving, uncomprehending, you know. So it's yeah, to, to, to introduce that, to infuse that into political discourse in the 21st century, I can see I can see the, the good that's at stake. Yes, definitely. I um, yeah, I, I would just what you were just saying reminds me of uh I don't remember, but many years ago in my course evaluations, uh, one, some student wrote, you know, uh, Professor Keyes has said a few times that she doesn't know something. <laughs> and like, this is, this is great. And I, my, my first reaction was, you know, usually when I don't, when I don't know something, especially early in my career was like, oh no, there's a problem. Like what I <laughs> haven't figured. But then you realize, no, like the, it's liberating. There's a lot that we don't know. And uh, to let the students know, it's okay for them not to know some, they, there's things they should know, but there's plenty that we, ha you know, it's fine if they haven't figured out yet. And I probably haven't either. So, um, and, and definitely politically, I think that sort of a healthy Augustine, and this is a point that Augustine stresses in a few places, the epistemic dimensions of, of humility or epistemological he thinks it's even one of the reasons perhaps why you know, there are ambiguities or obscurities in scripture that aren't easy to figure out, even by theologians who are learned and, and um, in, in full accord with the Catholic faith. There's a lot that's not easy. He also sees that in just, we would say maybe the sciences, um, how difficult it, that, that there are many things in nature that are obscure, that are utilities of things, for example, uh, that are hard to figure out. And Augustine speaks of, uh, how to say it, um, yeah, well, of, of these, these aspects of not knowing as, as a call to, um, or yeah, just a, an invitation to, to grow in humility and to, uh, to uh, combat pride. So yeah, I, and I, I concur. I think there's, there's a lot of space for that sort of admission. And, and I think for Augustine, it's a, it's a joyful admission. Yeah, we're not God. We don't know everything. We're not perfect. Um, and I, I think you're right. I, I think it could really benefit democratic discourse if, if uh, officials and 
and administrative bodies, et cetera, were more open and honest when, when the things aren't. I mean, I'm not saying that I'm not claiming that any particular entity or body wasn't, but if, if that was an ideal that we strove for more, more conscientiously, I think it would be great. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, in the lecture, you captured the sense that the heart of humility is the recognition and reception of the terrible fact, which turns out to be a liberating fact that this is given to us, right? That it's a gift. Um, and I'm thinking, you know, St. Paul in first Corinthians four, you know, what do you have that you have not received? If therefore you have received, it, why do you boast as if it were your own? So maybe this, yeah, maybe this would just be a good point with which to end is just this idea of the gift of our lives, of God's life, which he mediates to us. And, and maybe Augustine's, yeah, his, his admiration, his marvel, his appreciation before that. Do you just have a, a final word to say about how we stand before the gift uh, alongside St. Augustine? Sure. So one, one passage that I find really beautiful in the City of God is Augustine reflecting on uh, the, uh, the Roman, well, the ancient peoples outside of Israel, right? Their search for God, kind of groping, use that Pauline metaphor also, groping, getting maybe a little closer, a little further. But he speaks of how the, uh, and there was a, an introduction at one point of, of felicitas, of happiness as a goddess in, in the ancient Roman world. And Augustine suggests, you know, this shows that those worshipers were, were, they became aware that happiness had to be a gift of God. They didn't know the name of the giver. So they took the name of the gift, right? And, and said, well, let's worship, let's worship this. And, um, and there's, there's a sense there that Augustine's like, well, they're just close. Like, just look for the real giver and worship him. <laughs> like, that's, that's what you need to do. And, um, and so, yeah, that there's, and, and so here we even have a, an example of, of outside of Israel and the church of, of people groping for and sensing, well, happiness has to be a gift. It has to be a gift from God or a God somehow. And, for Augustine, one of the things I, I also love, sometimes he's, he um, can be presented as someone who's a little heavy or very serious, but there's this sense of wonder and the gift of the openness to the miraculous, the sense of the wonder of the created world, the wonder of our own being and creation, and and um, the sense of, yeah, the, the unexpected, the surprising, the, yeah, and uh, so I think reading Augustine too, he also loves quoting Plotinus, who speaks of the beauty of the, the little things in creation, as well as the, the great things in, in this world. And Augustine will see a parallel there between uh, Plotinus and, and our Lord and Jesus saying, well, consider the lilies of the field. You know, they're, they're arrayed more splendidly than Solomon. So there, there's this real openness to gift and the, and the nature as a gift and grace as, as the gift par excellence. And I think Augustine's very liberating in that regard as well. That's wonderful. And that's a, a beautiful note with which to conclude. Um, so thank you so much for taking the time. I greatly appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Father Gregory. Thank you very much. Yeah. And for, for those who would like to, to follow up with your work, maybe we could make mention of the book to which reference has been made several times. What's the full name of it? And then we can, we can link to it in the show notes. So the full name is Pride, Politics, and Humility in Augustine City of God. Um, and here I can do a, a little commercial, which is the paperback is going to come out in a couple of weeks. So, oh, uh, nice. so that, that will be a much more uh, for readers who are interested in, and who like to have a physical copy of a book. Uh, this yeah. will be a much more economical mode of procuring <laughs> the book. Nice. So uh, that, that will be coming out, I think, in mid-July. And it's, it's okay, available wonderful. for order. Yeah. Okay. And that's, I'm, I'm assuming it's available through Amazon, but is it available through the publisher's website too? I think so. It's a little harder to find. They're, they're emphasizing the online form, formats more, okay. which is another, another fun way. But yes, it's available through, uh, through Cambridge also. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. All right. Well, thanks so much. Oh, thank you, Father. And yeah. Yeah, it's a joy. Okay. All right. And then turning to you, the listener, thanks so much for having tuned into this episode of Off Campus Conversations. Uh, with the Thomistic Institute podcast. If you haven't yet, please do subscribe, whether on YouTube or on your podcast app, as uh, Whimsy would have it. And uh, we'll just look forward to chatting with you at the next opportunity. So know of our prayers for you. Please pray for us. And until then, cheers. Cheers.